Can you hear me okay? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Hi. Yes. Nice to meet you. It's first time to meet you Thank through the you. online. <laughs> Can you hear me all right? The sound okay? Uh, please a little bit speak up. Uh, okay. I have a, perhaps a little issue with my uh, speaker. Let me check. I'm sorry, I didn't open up the Zoom earlier because I have another class just uh, right before. So I just oh, finish okay. up. Okay. So anyway, where are you from? <laughs> where I'm from? I'm from Russia originally, but I work in France now. So You are now in? In France. France? Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're originally from Russia? Correct. Now you're working in the France. What mm -hmm. part of France? Uh, Lyon. Lyon. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's a, like a. It's considered to be a south of France. Here. Very traditional city, right? It is. It's very yes. It's very conservative, I would say. Conservative. Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, like in all sense of the world. Okay. Anyway, I'm I'm highly appreciate you accept my request for our students. We are from South Korea and I saw your CV and I I I, I saw your uh, the academic performance uh, from the <coughs> first color and I uh, send the email to you and I want invite you your research uh, for our students. Anyway I once again I am very thankful to your acceptance. I'm going to introduce you to our student briefly, and then I'm giving this stage to you, okay? Okay. Um, hello, student, again. Uh, once again, uh, due to the time difference, I inviting uh, uh, Dr. Uh, <laughs> Kasha. Uh, Don't worry. <laughs> okay, sorry. And I introduce you. Uh, she is from uh what uh, from Russia, and she's uh, now working in the, um, France, Lyon, associate professor, marketing, wow, vice head for research at Institute Paul Kouche. <laughs> I don't know, editor in chief, but analyst of touring research, empirical 
insights and as associate in analysis of tourism research, which is the top top journal in our uh, field, tourism field. Dr. Kurilova received her PhD from Purdue University. Wow, great school. And she also served as assistant and then associate professor at the School of Hotel Tourism Management, Hong Kong Poly U, okay. And she has published over 40 peer-reviewed publication focusing on tourist experience and destination aesthetics. aesthetics. And she particularly enjoyed focusing tourism and philosophy in her research. In her free time, well, she, Dr. Kolova enjoyed pondering the significance of life. Great. <laughs> what? Death? Wow. And the meaning of it all. Okay. Very unique and peculiar uh, topics. Actually, so far I never, never seen before this kind of topics from. Oh, I want uh, to be the, different. <laughs> CV. Okay. From now on, uh, it's your stage, please. Uh, one and a half hours and the thirty minutes Q and A, but it's your style. It's up to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's morning here, but afternoon where you are. Uh, thank you very much for having me. That's truly an honor and pleasure to be speaking to you today. Um, as, uh, as I've been already introduced, I am going to just share the slides with you. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, please do not hesitate to ask. You can just raise your hand. I should be able to see in Zoom, or you can just yell if you want. <laughs> if you cannot hear me, uh, please also let me know, because I've been told there's some issue with my speaker on a computer. Uh, sometimes it works fine. Sometimes it doesn't work very well. So I will try to speak louder. Um, let me start sharing. You'll see it? Yes, I can see you. Thank you. Well, um, among the many topics that I research on, my area of uh, interest really about experiences, tourism experiences in tourism, experiences in hospitality as well. But uh, one area of research that I'm particularly passionate about is about beauty. I find beauty very important to human life, uh, to our well-being. And there is a very long and well-established body of research outside of tourism that provides evidence how beauty is important to us as humans. However, surprisingly, there was not very much on that when it comes to travel and tourism. And in fact, my very first paper that I published as a PhD student was on beauty and aesthetics. And I have tried throughout my career, I have tried to develop it further. And what I would like to present uh, to you today, after my introduction, which has been already pretty well explained, is uh, what I would like to talk about is a little bit of background of the earlier studies of aesthetics and tourism that come from, uh, from my time of being a PhD student. And then I would like to update you what has happened so far, because I have recently published a literature review in Annals um, on the topic. So I have a good understanding about what has happened, what is happening, and where we are going as a field. And I will give you some suggestions for those of you who are looking for topic for research. Uh, I will give you suggestions which topics you can take in uh, tourism and, and tourism regarding beauty and where you can publish them. So about me, I have been already presented. Um, just wanted to add that I also, before joining academia, I worked in tourism and hospitality for eight years. I worked mostly in the restaurants uh, in New Orleans in the US. And I had a little bit experience also in a destination marketing organization in New Orleans as well. So my job was to promote or help promote and sell destination to international markets. Um, I'm editor in chief in Annals of Tourism Research and associate editor in uh, Annals of, um, of Empirical Insights and associate editor is and ATR, which is uh, one of the top journals in the field and one of the oldest journals. 
So my job is to, so when you submit a paper, um, editor-in-chief, which we have two, we have Scott McCabe and Sara Dolnikar. They will look at the paper, and if it's within my expertise, they will send it to me, or another associate editor, and it's up to us to handle the review process. So ultimately, the decision about whether your paper is accepted is with edu uh, associate editor. So I am I deal with topics regarding uh, beauty, regarding aesthetics, regarding uh, philosophy, and experiences and also sociology of tourism. So recently, uh, Arnold has launched a special initiative, which is a called Curated Collections. So this initiative invites various associate editors who are experts in a very certain area of research to have a kind of like a special issue, but it's not exactly a special issue because you can submit papers for all the time. So it doesn't have an end and beginning and an end. So I'm in charge of such a special issue exactly in beauty and aesthetics and tourism. So I will talk a little bit more later, but that's the uh, way I would like if anybody, if any of you is working on a related topic, has to do with beauty, attractiveness, ugliness, and so on, please consider submitting to Anos, to my collection. I will be very happy to know that this research lives on and the more and more researchers engage in it. Okay. So I already mentioned my areas of research that you see the words on the right. So, so this is the plan for today, what I'd like for us to do. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the fundamental concept of uh, aesthetics, not necessarily in tourism, but in general. Aesthetics is not obviously a tourism concept. It has been developed since ancient times. So aesthetic judgment is a critical, a critical concept. I will share a research I have done in the very beginning, which was one of the very few first papers published in tourism on the topic. Then I would like to talk about effects of destination aesthetics or effects of destination beauty. Uh, there has been quite a significant, uh, well, significant, relatively significant uh, number of studies about how destination beauty affects various outcomes. So I will talk about one study because uh, specific research that I have done. And uh, what is the most interesting is the last part about what's next. And this is where I would like to spend a bit more time. So that's the plan. So aesthetic judgment is really a question uh, of what makes a destination beautiful. Of course, it's not limited to a destination. It's what makes an object beautiful. It's what makes uh, a human more beautiful than another person. So this is essentially a judgment of what makes something beautiful. So I'm gonna show you this. Do you think this is beautiful? Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Do you know what it is? Do you know what Near it is? Pole. Exactly. <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna show you something different. How about that? It's beautiful. Yeah, what is it? Hong Kong. Yes. <laughs> Kuryong Island. <laughs> so the reason I showed you is because these two photos are really different, right? Yes. And I meant if, even if I, I ask you, imagine you being here or here, and you tell me that's both and beautiful or attractive, depends how which word we use, but they're completely different. One mm. is a nature, another one is a city. Uh, this is light, this is day, this is night. Mm -hmm. There is water that is flowing. This is water, they're just um, you know, very calm. Mm -hmm. Two completely different things, mm -hmm. two completely different environments. But tourists would find both of them very likely to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. So and the question actually becomes, what makes a destination beautiful? What is this criteria that people use to judge when something is more attractive than the other? And this is particularly interesting because uh, in tourism, people travel to see sites. We even have this expression, right? A tourist attraction, a tourist site. Site is usually something we see. Mm -hmm. So it's a big part of tourism experience. It's also related to a concept, tourist concept of tourist gaze, which is the way, a structured way, a tourist looking at a destination. And it's very much visual. There has been late, late updates to the concept that argue that tourist gaze is not just visual but it is mostly visual, it's well agreed. 
So imagine all of that and tourism being one of the oldest activities we give to the humans, there has been no attention and nobody asked the question, what makes one destination more beautiful than other? And there has been no established line of research on that. So this is exactly what basically was the idea behind the first project I'm going to talk about. So what is aesthetic judgment? Aesthetic judgment is a very controversial and also very historically rich concept that really has uh, has history since Aristotle, since the Greeks and even before. So uh, there are many perspectives. I prefer to use a simpler one, simpler definition by Thomas de Aquinas, which was another philosopher. It's which gives pleasure when things seen. So basically, basically if a destination an object, when you look at it, gives you pleasure, it means it's beautiful, okay? Which means you made a positive aesthetic judgment. If you look at destination or a particular, I don't know, building and you say it's ugly, this is also aesthetic judgment, but a negative one, okay? So uh, there are two competing views on the nature of aesthetic judgment, and it's probably what your, your question you have in your mind. Uh, there is one view that argues that aesthetic judgment is objective, which means a certain object has a specific set of properties that makes it beautiful objectively, which means everybody in the world, when looking at this object, will make it a positive aesthetic judgment because of the way it is. So philosophers such as Plato, Aristotle, Descartes were proponents of this view. They're a bit earlier, right? They were all the philosophers. Then there is a subjective view. Yes. Is that question? question? Yes. Very interesting question to you. Yes. You're, you're from Western society and um, and the Western philosophy. This is all Western philosophy uh, coming from Greeks and, and then 18th centuries. But the, we have uh, Eastern philosophy. Exactly. From China, you 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 was in the Hong Kong, so Hong Kong is part of the China, and Chinese philosophy is just a long as long as much like a Greek philosophy, mm -hmm. and but as far as I know, the Chinese philosophy doesn't mention the aesthetics, but they mention the I, and as an organism, organism. And then they saw something beautiful stuff, and they realized it was happy. It was a, it was a happy and joy sort of things. And then they mentioned the emotional, emotional stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's a bit different, but the Greek Greek philosophers they mentioned exactly the keyword aesthetic judgment. That's but, where it came from. Yeah. yeah. Asian, the old philosophy, they mention organism and the object. And then they feel happy. Absolutely. And uh, that's a big, uh, what I'm going to talk about actually in the end, how much all the, be, all the research we have is based on this Western. I'm not, I don't consider myself being a Western because I come from Asian part. Russia is very different from a European uh, mm -hmm. intellectual tradition as well. We have our own intellectual tradition, mm -hmm. even when it comes to aesthetics. It's closer to West to European than mm -hmm. Chinese, but mm -hmm. still it's not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So I do understand your question, but, and what we see in research actually that majority, so I have done a little talk about uh, my literature review mm -hmm. and I have analyzed 39 studies. There is mm -hmm. no more, only 39 studies exist on tourism and aesthetics mm -hmm. since the beginning of the field. Only one, one study looked at actually concept of fusion from Ch uh, it's actually ca Chinese concept. It's not aesthetics at all, but it's what you're talking about, right? It's a certain way of looking of things that gives you pleasure. And therefore you, you, you find it pleasurable to look at, not exactly beautiful. Only one. Interestingly, there are, there are studies done in Korea. Their studies have, are done in China quite a lot. But all of them rely on the Western European intellectual tradition. And that's problematic. This is exactly, that's totally, your critique is well taken. Absolutely agree. So that would be my, uh, it's actually one of the areas of research that I propose in the end. 
try to look at your own aesthetic traditions, your own philosophical movements. That's where most contributions can happen. Don't just simply borrow what Kant said, which is what we have right now. Yeah. Thank you for your interjection. <laughs> Uh, the other perspective is a subjective perspective, right? Which says that, yes, objects may have certain properties more than others, but essentially uh, each person can judge for him or herself to which extent something beautiful or ugly, and even may use a different criteria. And I will talk more about Kant further. Why Kant? Because he published the most um, extensive uh, work on aesthetic at that time, uh, which was a long, long time actually, right? End of 19th, 18th century. And his famous work called Critique of Judgment. And again, back to previous question, uh, this is right now, most of studies, overwhelming majority of studies, including my own, are focusing on this. We all use Kant ideas. Why? I think I actually don't have an answer to it. I think this is just what we are taught in school maybe. Maybe this is what you read when you Google. Because so far, perspective is just there is nothing exists by Kant, but things do exist. <laughs> okay. But before we move on here, I want to, before critiquing Kant, I want to explain what Kant ideas were. So Immanuel Kant uh, said that for, uh, objects are not particularly have the same properties. So his critique is very different from Aristotle. So objects could have different properties get, that can give pleasure to people when looking at it. However, what's important is this idea of disinterestedness. It's a very famous Kant term. He said that disinterested, it means that if you're looking at object and enjoy, not because it gives a certain, a certain value, it doesn't have actually functional reason, right? We are not interested in liking something. It just gives us pleasure, pleasure without a certain intention. And what he said, which is very, a little controversial and difficult to get, Took me a while. He said that I said a judgment is subjective, but universal. So what that actually means, and there are some different perspectives, there are some interpretations, but uh, let me uh, and somebody else can think of the you know, of the Niagara Falls as I can think it's very beautiful, and other person think it's not as beautiful. But the thing is when we encounter what we feel as very beautiful, it feels in the same way. So it doesn't matter where you're located, if you're Chinese, if you're Russian, if you're French, you may find things differently, what, what makes something beautiful not in the same way, but when you do find something beautiful, we feel it in the same way. And that's the idea of universal. So uh, David Hume expanded, uh, not really expanded, it was a bit before, but it sounded a bit like expanded because he also uh, looked into subjective judgment. And he basically said that people, we use our unique backgrounds. So it depends who you are. So if I have seen Niagara Falls many times before, maybe I won't be as impressed as somebody who sees it for the first time. So he also says that there is no such a thing as my judgment better than yours. We all, there is no such a superior judgment. Okay, so no, no judgment here. So what we have done, this is I'll talk about the empirical part right now, given this conceptual part. Oh yeah, another thing I forgot to say, that Kant and Hume and basically all the philosophers in Western European tradition are not an expert on Eastern, Eastern philosophy and aesthetics, so I cannot say that. Uh, they talk about objects. So we talk about paintings, pieces of art, uh, lamps, computers, colors. Nobody talks about, oh, well, they have later in 19th century, they started talking about environment. In tourism, however, we are not in a gallery, right? We are not going in a museum and looking at paintings only. You're immersed in environment. And that's actually introduces a different import, a different connotation to this idea of aesthetic judgment. So there is a judgment of objects and there is a judgment of environments. And we do know quite a lot, um, actually from research in psychology, for example, in consumer research as well, empirical research, experimental studies, MRI studies, when, this, when they connected humans' brains into MRI machines. We know quite a lot actually about objects, how we judge objects, but we almost know nothing about how we judge environments. And many would argue judging environments is much more complex 
first of all, it's multisensory, it's not just about visual. And second, it's more extensive and it lasts longer. If there's just look an object a little bit, we touch it maybe, but in environment and tourism, we can spend day, two, three, a week. So that's much more complex. Okay. All right, so what we have done for this specific study, we have done seven, 57 semi-structured interviews with Americans. Okay, so it's important to keep this in a context. Uh, we, it was very simple. Uh, we have interviewed, it was a content analysis, uh, not in-depth interview, it was a rather structured interview. Uh, it lasted about 30 minutes. And we asked a very simple, simple question. What is the most beautiful city or nature destination that you have visited? And we ask, why did you find it beautiful? Uh, so for example, people will tell me Chicago. I'm like, okay, why? They say, well, okay, because there is a bean. And I was like, and, and I would say, why did you find this bean so beautiful? Why it was so important? So we use this technique of five whys, where we would ask per person why and why and why, and drive them crazy in the interview until there is no us, no other why to go. And it's interesting because people never thought about it. We do, and when we travel, we do think, if I ask you, ask you, do you think uh, Hong Kong is beautiful? If you've been there, you would say yes, no, so, so, so. But if I'm going to ask you why, well, you might think uh, you'll take maybe a couple of minutes to tell me. But if I'm going to ask you why again, and why again, and why again, this really makes you think and reflect. And it's not how it works in a regular life when we travel, we don't think about it. We just produce judgment in unconsciously, we don't deconstruct this process. So that's what basically what we were doing. We tried to deconstruct this process and make it conscious during the interview. And we also ask a cross-validation, cross-validating question. What is the ugliest place you visited? Just to make sure that the criteria would be similar because if not, then we have an issue of, uh, of validity in our data, right? Krishna, okay. I have a question. Yes. You mentioned the keyword uh, consciously. So what do you think about the conscious unconsciously regarding aesthetic point? Some people look at the beautiful girls walking down the street and they look at unconsciously. But some people think it, oh, it's cognitively consciously. What do you think about that? Yes, uh, that's another black box. <laughs> we are called the black box <laughs> of experience. I'll also talk about it later. So far, I talk about aesthetic judgment, which means actually the output, right? We have input, so we have like a Hong Kong, but this is an input. Then we have this black box, something happens in our brain. Mm -hmm. We actually don't know what. <laughs> and then we have output, yes, beautiful or not. So uh, that's black box, we call, we call experience. Experience, uh -huh. it could be conscious, in fact. If uh -huh. I'm with you, if I ask a question, you uh -huh. can, we can process it, right? But uh, so far, we don't have this in tourism research, we don't have a study on that. Mm. In psychology, they do mm. study objects and pieces mm -hmm. of art. Mm. So they actually put you in an MRI machine mm -hmm. <laughs> and they will show you uh, pieces of like a painting, for example. Mm. Or sometimes they will show you a brand label. And they will look into your brain, how, which kind of areas it activates. Mm -hmm. And then you come, they come out, they will ask you why you found it beautiful. So this, whatever happens in our brain, is not conscious effort. Right? Mm. What is conscious is a decision later, mm. whether it is beautiful or not. But people mm. cannot most time process exactly, they cannot explain exactly why. Right? So it's more like a rash, ra rationalization. But again, we don't know a lot. So if mm. you have a research project on that, that mm. would be a very cool project mm. <laughs> to talk about. Mm -hmm. I have a PhD student in Hong Kong who just mm. graduated, and mm. she was doing research on that. Mm -hmm. But she used uh, phenomenology. Mm. But phenomenology, as I'm sure you probably you probably know, is mm. a conscious process. Mm. So it's asking person to think back or think during ah. and what you're aware of. So it's actually forcing people to be aware. But it's not natural process, right? When we travel, we don't do that. <laughs> it's more like trying to push people to do it for the sake of science. Ah. So yeah. Definitely, there is a lot of room to, to do. I don't have an answer exactly for you, though. <laughs> okay. All right. um, but you picking up on all the research uh, areas that I, well, I was going to talk about later, how to actually advance this, because those are exactly the gaps we have. So uh, we basically uh, came up, uh, we, we did a content analysis to analyze this. 
uh, which is pretty, pretty simple. We analyze positive aesthetic judgment and then a negative aesthetic judgment and we cross-validated this, right, to make sure it's the same. So we arrived at nine criteria and 29 dimensions. So basically a dimension is a specific agroshoyleta, specific uh, range that has a uh, two words kind of like semantic differential, I'll show you. And those are groups. So keep in mind, this is a qualitative research, right? So we really did uh, this grouping based on qualitative data. Uh, I will show you another study with you later where we try to empirically or specifically quantitatively validate this by using, uh, by developing a scale. But this is another skill yet. So I would like to, right now, I would like to go over one by one, one of these dimensions, one of these criteria, give you examples, okay? And tell you one, one important thing. So basically there are nine, spoke, perceived age, upkeep, sounds. Sounds interesting because it's only one that was non-visual. Everything else is visual, right? Interesting. Balance, variety, shape, novelty, and uniqueness. So take a look. So when I talk about scope, it's actually a magnitude of tourist destination. So dimensions, specific dimensions are five. I'll write it here. Colorful, dark, grand, quaint. So quaint, I'm not sure you know the word. It's a small but cute. Okay, so it could be really big or small but cute. When there are a lot of people, when there are people, when there are no people, when there is a lot of things, when there are very few things, abundance, courtesy, scarcity, openness and narrowness, right? What I would like to highlight here, it's a, it's a criteria, it's a semantic differential, which means colorful doesn't mean that it's better than dark. Grant doesn't mean it's better than quaint, okay? So that's not a direction of aesthetic judgment. Let me illustrate this. This is a quote from one of the participants. When I say beautiful, I mean really vibrant color in the water, and you can see it very clear, vibrant, vibrantly colored. That was an example of beautiful. And then the same participant was talking about another destination. The water was dark and calm, almost like glass, but you couldn't see through. Another example of beauty, okay? So be very careful about not interpreting this as having a direction, okay? It's true for all but one. There is one exception. So, so this is just an example of what it was, okay? So you might find left picture and right picture equally beautiful, even though they're not the same, but it's the same criteria, okay? Our job here, our purpose was to find a criteria, not necessarily a direction of aesthetic judgment. So this is example of a grand versus quaint, okay? So the first example here, it's very big monumental architecture, right? And that was considered to be beautiful, but this was too. This is cute, small, also beautiful. By the way, I have a question for you. Where do you think this is? What is it? Sprite? No, what is this one? Uh, which, which city or country? France. No. What? <laughs> not, not France, not France, no. Uh, Russia? I'll give you Russia, yes. yes. Santa, Where? Santa Petersburg. No, no. It's Moscow. Moscow. But guess, guess what object is this? What place is this? It's a, it's a, it's a palace. Present no. palace. It's actually a metro station. What? It's a metro <laughs> station. So if anybody have ever been to Eastern Europe, particularly Kiev, Minsk, Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, Moscow, Saint Petersburg, ah. uh, during Soviet time. The metro stations were supposed to be pieces of art. And this is one of the central metro stations in Moscow. Oh, and I see. But you will see similar in many in other stations as well. So mm. that's normal. That's not exception. Okay. Mm. Just wanted to show that. Okay. How about this one? Where do you think this is? Uh, not Europe. Not Europe. Not Europe. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, China. Mm -mm. Shanghai, no? No, not Asia either. <laughs> ah, really? Uh, where is it? Um, South Africa. No, one more, one more try. 
Australia? No, it's actually uh, New England in the U.S. I think it's Massachusetts. Massachusetts. I don't, it's a small town in Massachusetts. Yes, it's okay. not Boston. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you some questions sometimes from like this. <laughs> <laughs> Wake anyway, up. Anyway, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. I don't want you to sleep, okay? And just to test your travel exposure <laughs> when you have been what you have seen. All right, so this is just an example of the very first dimension, which is a, a criteria, which is a scope, right? Another interesting, which came up, which is something, honestly, I did not expect. And anyway, in existing literature, we did not see. Hmm from consumer research, from philosophy pieces of art, from art psychology, we did not see that. It was a perceived age of destination. Mm. I have age in quotes because uh. it's not actual age. Uh. So some destinations would appear more modern, mm. like for example, Hong Kong, right? Singapore, Shanghai, very mm. futuristic. And mm. some destination would be historic. Mm. And it's not really about age, mm. right? So some destination, like Shanghai is not a new area. Uh, and the just that some destination destination chose to keep the historic look, mm -hmm. while some decided to evolve. And the second dimension, which is young versus old, interestingly, it referred to people. If you people you see in the destination mostly young people, for example, some places are college towns, right? there are many younger people because of the universities there, and some people there some areas are more people who retire working mm -hmm. around. This surprisingly, mm. that was very prominent in how people judge a mm. tourist destination. So I gave you an example here. I like all the modern design in the city, especially those facilitated by technology. I don't like backwardness. So for this person, more historic was more beautiful than or modern was more beautiful than historic. Mm. For the other person was opposite. It's kind of old architecture, old stone, the area around it too. There is just an old historic feeling to it. So I'll show you another picture. So historic right. versus modern, right? Mm. So what do you think this one is, the modern part? The soul. No, <laughs> but <laughs> Asia. <laughs> Not Korea. <laughs> it's a... Uh... <laughs> It's uh, where is it? Uh, Shanghai. Oh uh, no, it's a Singapore actually. Singapore. But I see your point because they kind of look the same. The modern part, <laughs> so the same way they look very similar. Okay. How about the right photo? This one. And uh, New Orleans. Yes, that's New wow. Orleans. <laughs> yes. And I reason I wanted to show you New Orleans because New Orleans is not actually old. It's uh, uh, for example, in France when they say something. Old, they mean 2000 or thousands of years, right? If they say something recent, it means it's like 300 years, it's recent. So New Orleans actually was, was actually founded in the late 18th century. It's not old, mm -hmm. but they just decided to keep this feel, mm -hmm. right? They decided to keep instead of uh, asphalt, uh, using asphalt, they actually use stone. Mm -hmm. That was a conscious decision mm -hmm. because they wanted to appear different than the rest of the United States, which is more modern oriented, mm -hmm. right? Okay, just wanted to emphasize that. So this is another criteria, which is upkeep. And this, of course, makes sense. We definitely expected this one. Mm -hmm. Perceived state of physical attributes. Mm -hmm. So destination could be clean or destination could be dirty. Mm -hmm. It could be well-maintained or run down. And this is the only criteria that has a specific set of direct, sense of direction. If it's dirty, it's not beautiful. If it's clean, it's beautiful. Okay, and this is uh, the only one out of nine. Just wanted to emphasize that. So when it comes to dirty and clean, it's not just about trash. In fact, it's not about if you wash the streets or not. There are many other things. Air pollution actually is contributes to the perception of being dirty, even if Kusha, the streets. If, yeah. if you consider air pollution. Uh, would be the the physical attribute. Why why don't you consider that is uh, smells? It I, it didn't come up. It didn't. I it's that's was actually interesting because out of all of these dimensions, only one was about sound. None were about other senses. That was mm -hmm. strange, which mm -hmm. is also something I'm gonna talk later. Mm -hmm. It just people didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. There is another study that my PhD student did when she specifically probed for this. 
but we also did interview with different. We actually interviewed them right after the date. So they went to look in Hong Kong and we had an interview in the evening. So I think it was more fresh in their memory and people talked about it. And she also tried to steer the interview in this direction to talk about sounds and smells and temperature, how body feels, sense of touch and all of that. But in this study, we actually asked them, so in the last six months they had to travel. So I think it's maybe it's a memory bias, but also pers personally, I think people just don't think about that. They feel it as a destination, but then they come back home and they think about what they saw, but they don't think about what it smells like. So it just simply didn't come up, but yeah, it makes sense, why not, right? So that's one of the limitations of the study that we collected data not during and very quite, we waited quite some time. So it seems like what's remaining in the memory is more visual. But in Hong Kong, the one we did in Hong Kong, actually, with my students, she did have like us um, this thing about this too much, too much smell, so of like stinky tofu. Mm. <laughs> but they didn't oh. think it was ugly, though. <laughs> they didn't think it was not beautiful. However, it was interesting. They thought mm -hmm. it was it adds to authenticity, mm -hmm. and uh, it's another type of experience we call the borderline experience, mm. which it's not part of this presentation, but it's my student who work on this subject, and it's interesting. Yeah, how this kind of multi-sensory aesthetics contributes to a borderline. Mm. So it's not exactly beautiful, not exactly ugly, somewhere in mm. between. And it's actually, it's a positive experience. Yeah. Thanks for your question. All right. Uh, sound. So this is the only multi-sensory dimension we had, mm. surprisingly. Mm. And there were three, uh, three specific criteria. Lively, peaceful. So sounds could be really like in a city. Many people said that there's a cars going on in New York, for example. There is a taxi, there are people talking, there is a very lively atmosphere. Human made versus nature made, right? If it's a trees or if it's a bird singing, and they're loud versus quiet. And just an example here that loud but peaceful is also possible. One participant talked, this participant was actually talking about Niagara Falls. She was saying that the sheer force of the water is pretty aspiring. If you go out in one of the boats at the bottom, you can get a pretty good perspective on how powerful they are. So this another criteria is a sense of balance, which is appropriateness of cues and what you see to an environment. Human touch, no human touch. I'm gonna show you a photo for that example. For example, uh, artificial or authentic. authentic. It's actually, it actually was quite obvious to people to recognize, I don't know, you have like historic area, these are old buildings, and then do you have a very modern structure there. To them, it seemed out of place, not balanced, and most of them didn't think it was a beautiful, but again, it really depends on the context, okay? Cohesive or out of place. Uh, that's one example of human touch, no human touch. If you have one beautiful natural scenery in one direction and a parking lot in the other, it's kind of ugly. What's interesting, however, when we talk about nature destination, let's say this person was talking about a national park. We don't want to see human touch. <laughs> but if you talk about urban destinations, let's say a cityscape, nature touch is always welcome. Okay, so but it doesn't work the other way around. So just wanted to emphasize. So this is an example. Where is that? Mm. It's the I same, don't know. same location. Is it Vietnam? No, but it is Asia. Yeah. Hong Kong? Yes, <laughs> I knew you were going to get it, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> yeah, it's a Hong Kong. It's a one. It's actually an island where I used to live, Lama Island. Uh -huh. So I know people think of Hong Kong as all these buildings and all of that, but the majority of Hong Kong is actually a nature land. So uh, the picture on the left, it's actually the same island, it's just from a little different di directions of the picture was taken. So here we see a trail, right? And it's obviously not, it doesn't come out as a natural trail. Mm -hmm. So it has a rail and it has a stones here. Mm -hmm. So it would be an example of a human touch. Mm -hmm. This one, we also see a trail, but it doesn't have a rail and it's mm -hmm. more natural. So it doesn't mm -hmm. have a stone to it. Mm -hmm. So for nature-based destination, According to our participants, this would be more welcome than that. Mm. But of course, in Hong Kong, there are other there is a climatic conditions. In, in, to Kosha, that. in terms of this picture, I, mm -hmm. just one thing I, I remind, actually in South Korea, 
uh, I like uh, uh, hiking and climb mountain. We have uh, uh, several the mountains, uh, famous mountains in South Korea, and the many um, mountains they build up the stairs uh, mm -hmm. for for comfortable you know climbing for the people. But mm -hmm. actually, that stairs is, is is looks very you know ugly. So I don't like you that. Made an judgment. <laughs> uh, I don't like that. You know the the artificial stairs uh, mm -hmm. uh, into the beautiful mountains. Mm -hmm. But in in South Korea government and then the local government again and again build up that stairs, which is destroy that the scenery and the mountains. Mm -hmm. But what? But they say. Uh, if not the trail or the the artificial stairs, that the mountain is destroyed because the human beings uh, step down the here and there, and then that nature is destroyed because of that stuff. So they say artificial sta stairs would be protect the destruction of the beautiful scenery. What do you think about that? Yes, uh, well. I'm not an expert on conservation, but I did notice living from Asia and Russia and here and in the US, I also lived in the US before for 10 years. So there's a different approaches. <laughs> and in Asia, you're right, like here, I heard it in Hong Kong as well. So they think it's more environmentally friendly to do this than this. And again, I'm not a biologist, I don't exactly know, but in France, it's completely opposite. They would never do this because it's, they consider this destroying the nature and also devaluing aesthetics for the visitors, right? So I don't know which one is right, which one is wrong. I have never, I don't usually see that in Europe and I don't see that in North America, but mm. I see it a lot in Asia, including even in Vietnam. Uh, that, in that's that's an yeah. interesting point. Actually, yes. in England, they never uh, artificially built up their stairs or even worse uh, for protection. They just let the people uh, they kill themselves if they want. Go, go, you know, like a seven, seven, what, what, whatever, in, in England. So mm -hmm. they never touch that kind of artificial stairs and then the, 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 the buildings or whatever. But here in Asia, in, in South Korea, they do it a lot. Yeah. Yes. One of the studies I have in my literature review actually dealt with the same thing, exactly what you're talking about, but in China. It was actually one of the national parks in China. They looked at how building infrastructure and infrastructure, of course, it's meant to make experience more enjoyable for people, right? There is mm -hmm. a hotel, there is a restaurant, mm -hmm. people need to eat. There is a stairs, there is a lift mm -hmm. for people with reduced mobilities. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that how it degrades uh, aesthetic value of nature or wilderness. And mm -hmm. that's comes, it's kind of came the evidence was from China. They used it to collect the data from tourists. So, yeah. So that's 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 a problem. So that's the mm. issue of this. Uh, so when I do aesthetic research, it usually provides implications to policy. It's not really implication to the industry. But how do we maintain? How do we stage experiences in a way that, on one hand, does justice to a destination? And I'm gonna show you one case study from Korea, actually, exactly on this topic. But on the other one, on, but on the other side, it's uh, also enjoyable for tourists. The tourists come. And very often what we see when we start making a lot, when we do a lot of touristification, tourists start thinking it's as beautiful. They no longer think it's beautiful. And you destroy exactly the reason people are coming for. So we see it a lot. And we see it a lot in Hong Kong. So again, my students, and I'm going back to her, mentioning her research, she dealt with this issue in Hong Kong, how they took a lot of dilapidated old Chinese architecture buildings and renovated them. But now when you look at renovated buildings, you they look just like new. They lost the sense of authenticity. People don't find them beautiful anymore. They just look like new developments. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's gone. Even though technically it's still there, <laughs> it looks completely different. So yeah, and that's a, a, that's a bit different approach. Uh, in France, opposite. They try to maintain as much as possible to the point that sometimes they let area or church for example appear extremely ruined which to me is a bit too much <laughs> so i think there also need to be some maintenance but they that's just a different philosophy mm. how to approach it i don't know which one is better as long as it doesn't destroy that's for sure <laughs> yeah yeah that's a debate that it provides a lot of debates for that. Mm -hmm. 
Another criteria is a variety. Uh, basically, the dimension here, diverse versus alike. Uh, one example here is Hawaii. Uh, this person talks about Hawaii and the reason why he chose Hawaii to travel to, travel to and also had a great experience because, not just because it's beautiful. Hawaii is beautiful, but so many other places. But Hawaii has a diversity in its beauty. There is a sea, there is a mountain, there is a snow. Apparently, you can ski in Hawaii, which I did not know and lakes and there are just so many things and that's why it's beautiful okay so not simply because it's a sea another criteria is a sense of novelty and do keep in mind uh this aspect uh, because i'm going to come back to it in like a five minutes okay so novelty is of course makes sense it's fundamental to tourism we travel for leisure particularly to places that we haven't been which are novel to us because it's not like our home right What's interesting, the more novel it is in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, oh, not, I wouldn't say more novel, in terms of the, the, there has to be a distance, okay? How great is the distance is a question, we don't know. But there has to be a distance from your home environment. So here I have a quote of participant who lived in Indiana in US where I did my PhD. It was very cold in the summer or in the winter. So it's like minus 20 degrees, you can have snow, and for this participant, uh, when, when I ask you what is some beautiful destination, she said basically anything that is not like Indiana, <laughs> anything the world. And of course, I pressed her for a specific destination, but for her, it was something that is doesn't have snow, doesn't have winter, it doesn't have minus twenty degree. Automatically, it's beautiful because it's not the same. Okay, but of course, it invites a question about what is the optimal difference. There has been already a studies on that regarding a culture, when we talk about culture difference, which I feel like is part of culture, right? And our architecture is influenced by local culture and all of that. So we know from that line of research that too big of a cultural distance is not great either because people find it scary. So there has to be an optimal distance. But again, we don't know. There has been no research uh, on this, on what is the ultimate distance. But I will talk more about it in five minutes. Oh, that was novel to typicality, right? It's new or similar or not. Shape. So when it comes to shape, I was actually not surprised because any literature you read on aesthetics, on psychology, on consumer research, consumer aesthetics, you always find references to shape all the time. Uh, we know from art literature, for example, that round considered to be more beautiful, around objects are considered to be more beautiful than the angle objects. And we mentioned cultural difference before. Interestingly, in Asian cultures, and that's an empirical research that did experiments about objects, uh, round objects were much more beautiful than angle objects than it is in the Western cultures. So it's a very more value placed in a roundness. Symmetric asymmetric. Uh, we know from psychology research that symmetric faces, people who are considered more beautiful are people with just simple symmetric face. Your face doesn't have to be particularly beautiful, as long as it's symmetric. We as humans tend to judge it as beautiful. So again, that comes from objects, right? And then sophisticated or simplistic. So let me show you um, there's one to mention. Well, I expected that actually it came up very, it was not a prominent dimension at all. People just mentioned it a little bit, but it was not a determining criteria. Okay. So uh, this is an example of simplistic or sophisticated, right? So those two examples are both five-star hotels, okay? So this one is uh, located actually in China, in Chengdu. I don't remember the brand. It's one of the, I think it's a core, one of the core brands. Very, very, uh, not a chain hotel. And this hotel is located in Quebec in Canada. And this considered to be the most Instagrammable, the most photographed hotel in the world. <laughs> So as you can see, this would be, has a lot of features, they're round, they're not round, right? Very complex architecture. And this one is very simplistic. Again, I'm not here to say that one is better than another, is right? Both can provide a uh, positive aesthetic judgment. The last criteria is uniqueness. It basically, a destination needs to have a uniquely identifiable features, something you cannot find anywhere else. When I talk about Paris, people automatically think about Eiffel Tower, right? Actually, when you go see Eiffel Tower, to be personally, I was very disappointed that it's pretty ugly, but I don't find it beautiful. But then 
it makes Paris more unique and therefore more beautiful because everybody wants to see Paris is Eiffel Tower. But Eiffel is Eiffel Tower is not a Eiffel, it's not a Paris anymore, right? So which is this one? Where do you think this sculpture is located? This one. It's another uniquely identifiable picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a Chicago, I know. Yes, that's it. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I, so when I, when I talk to people, they told me about the Chicago being a lot because where I used to, when I did my research was near Chicago. So people, I mean, near, there's like three hour drive. So people used to go to Chicago a lot. So they always told me about Chicago being and I asked them, so what is it about being you found beautiful? And it's interesting, most of them admitted to me, they said, well, there's nothing particularly beautiful about being, to be honest, but it's just interesting. It's just not, you can't find it anywhere else. So therefore, Chicago is unique because of this being. So that's basically the last criteria of beauty, right? So I have gone through all nine. So what we have done after that is we tried to, so all of these nine criteria are not the same, right? I did present them in a kind of the same way, but they're not the same, they have different nature. And we try to organize this criteria according to two, two dimensions. Some criteria are more abstract, right? Some criteria are less, um, uh, uh, more concrete. Some are more objective when it comes to judgment. Some are more subjective. So for example, scale, right? When it, whether it's a grand, narrow or not narrow, it's very easy to measure. I mean, you just take a meter and measure it. So this is example of an objective criteria, right? Uh, concrete and uh, balance, novelty, diversity. This is pretty subjective in how people judge. More, I mean, it's all relative, more subjective, I would say. Abstract, uniqueness, scale, balance, and more concrete, time, more perceived age, sound, shape, conditions. Uh, I mean, this could be just photographed and people are more, more likely to, to see it practically, right? When I tell people uniqueness, it's a bit more abstract concept. So basically, based on that, we have four these we have rather four conceptual groups of these dimensions. Some of them are uniqueness and scale uh, would be objective but abstract, and uh, the ones that are easier to manage would be here, right? Because they're concrete and objective, they're very easy to manage. Clean up your destination, make sure you shape it in a way that your customers like, and make sure you don't have loud of quiet sounds depends on your target market, right? Very easy to fix. Those are the most difficult ones because people have a different ideas of subjective, different idea, abstract is more complicated to explain to stakeholders, but nonetheless, they're also important, right? And uh, in concrete and subjective, you have perceived age, still rather relatively easy to, to manage, but these two are quite complex, right? So when, they, when we talk about practical implication, policy implication, we always talk about understanding target markets, not so much in terms of this, not much, but very much in terms of that, okay? Because as a policymaker and a destination, it's difficult for you to gauge how people perceive it. Okay, so that was my first study that I wanted to show you, and probably the largest. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions about that? Before I move on to effects. Mm, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, you are uh, you have done the research greatly about the aesthetic and then measuring the using of a framework, uh measuring the destination like Hong Kong, Seoul, Paris, Berlin, London, New York, Washington, DC. So if what do you think about that? Berlin and Paris? Uh Probably there's a definitely different if you if I think Perry is much more aesthetic conceptually, perceptionally, and more emotionally. Berlin is more concrete and dry and modern something. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's kind of my subjective perception toward mm -hmm. a destination. Yeah. But people, people when they choose a certain specific destination they want to go to visit, probably that perception influenced the people's mind anyway. So this kind of a research is so important and critical. 
the methodological methodologically, if I collect data from TripAdvisor, when people visit a uh, certain destination like uh, Paris and Berlin, probably they leave online leave you about their experience. And then we can collect data from TripAdvisor about the certain specific destination and then using of your framework, you made it. It's going to be a new research. What do you yeah. think? Yes, uh, actually, yes, when I did, there are, there have, have, have been some studies who collected data on social media, not for this destination, not exactly this research question. Mm -hmm. But in my literature review, yeah, I did come across uh, mm -hmm. that data collected through, uh, actually, it wasn't Japan, but it was in China. So they collected mm -hmm. data using Chinese equivalent. Uh, mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, they looked in Chinese gardens mm -hmm. and how gaze is shaped, how tourist gaze shapes, how aesthetics in a mm -hmm. Chinese tourist garden shapes the tourist gaze of Chinese mm -hmm. tourists. And that was a great mm -hmm. research also because they didn't rely on Kant and Western tradition. So mm -hmm. really used indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. and they used Chinese concept mm -hmm. for that. Absolutely, there's so much room to explore. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. gonna I'm gonna talk about what you can do <laughs> specifically. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank so you. let me let me move on this uh here about effects because uh actually bef the one the study I presented to you before was very qualitative, right? So we can't exactly use to measure it. I mean, we haven't validated anything. It's really just a conceptual kind of framework. So it's not exactly useful um, practically. So uh, the next what I want to present is when we try to use these ideas and validate it quantitatively. And it's what we came up with actually not exactly what I have just showed you. There were some modifications. Another thing, another contribution of that research is because we have proposed a new concept called aesthetic distance. So to introduce this concept, I'm just going to show you photos, okay? So you can more relate to that. So imagine you live here. <laughs> imagine. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> now, you have you have a choice. You have a vacation for two weeks, and you have a choice. You can go destination one, or you can go to destination two. One. One. Why? <laughs> more of aesthetic to me. What? Yes, why, why is it my aesthetic for you? I like uh, natural scenery. Okay, so it's more nature to you. Okay. So now we imagine you live here. Wow. It's actually not far from Lyon. It's called Grenoble, the town, like about one hour from here. <laughs> so you live here all your life. You grew up here, you're born here, you live here. Now you go on vacation again for two weeks. You have a choice. Back, back to this choice. One or two? Uh, still one. Still one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we see for you, it's very personal preference, as you, you mentioned, right? You prefer my nature destination. But what I wanted to illustrate, that we, we, uh, this idea of novelty. Usually when we grow up in a certain area, let's say mountains, and you may just really like mountains, right, as well. So that doesn't exactly exclude that possibility either. Uh, we tend to, when we go on vacation, we tend to choose destination that is not like the, not my normal, usual environment because we want to see something different. Yes. Right. So that idea of novelty, as I mentioned to you about before. Yes, right. So we basically propose a new concept yeah. called aesthetic distance. So this is a perceived distance be between aesthetic properties of a destination and a tourist home environment. Right. That's environment right. the tourists are more used to. So our, our actual objectives on this specific research was to try to understand the effect. So here we try finally try to measure the effect of destination qualities, right, on aesthetic judgment of the entire destination and satisfaction. And we try to test the effect of distance because maybe the distance doesn't even exist, right? It's just we proposed conceptually. It doesn't mean it actually exists. So that was our basically the wow, research question. Interesting. Aesthetic distance. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Some ideas of cultural distance, actually. Yes, yes. Yeah. What, what about the, this question? You know, I have a two students from France, mm -hmm. and one is uh, 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 Lyon, and mm -hmm. another is uh, uh, Paris. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, they come to Seoul because of this theory. They are born in France and raised up there and they accustomed to the kind of a 
the European culture, but they mm-hmm. want to see a K-pop, K-drama, some sort of things, culture and clothes, and they explore their kind of a aesthetic distance. And they finally landing in Seoul and Korea because of that aesthetic distance. Is that right? Yes, but I think what you're talking about more cultural distance, right? Because K-pop is more like representation of cultural representation of Korea, mm-hmm. perception at least of it here in France. But aesthetic, but also aesthetic distance is uh is more about features. Let's say Lyon, right, is completely different. I've been to Seoul. It's mm-hmm. not even bad. It's completely different in terms of uh, colors we see, in terms of architecture, in terms of shops we see, the way they look, right? The sounds are different too. Smells, of course, but we didn't talk about smells here. So this is a difference. And uh, basically the idea here, the more you, the more different there is, per, of course, perceived. If I haven't been to Seoul, it would be perception shaped by destination marketing, right? Or organic destination image. The more likely I am to find Seoul beautiful. So we're actually looking at perception of beauty, not and satisfaction as well at tourism. And the 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 uh, hypothesis was that the higher the destination, the, the higher the aesthetic distance, the more likely tourists are going to judge a destination as beautiful, and also they will be more satisfied. But as I'm going to show you results, and it actually was not as simple. <laughs> so it did it did hold for some, and it did not hold for others. So. Uh, so basically, we, that was the 21 dimensions, right? The ones I showed you in a previous study. We use seven-point semantic differential scale. We rated, we asked tourists, we basically surveyed tourists who just came back from vacation. We asked them first to rate their home environment where they live, current city, according to this. And then we asked them to rate a destination where they just come from, according to these seven criteria, okay? And first, we, of course, there is no scale. So first, we have to develop a scale. So we use the split sample approach. First uh, half, half was for EFA, was exploration, another one for validation. And after that, we used, um, after we have come up with factors, and you will see they were not exactly the ones we conceived in the previous study. They will do, we basically taste, use multiple regression to taste effect of each of these criteria on the satisfaction. And then we calculated the distance. We subtracted home environment from destination environment. And the more the number, right, the bigger the distance. And then we did the regression of that on the aesthetic judgment and satisfaction. So, oh, yeah, we also controlled for nature versus urban because we know from previous research in environmental psychology that nature destinations tend to be judged as more beautiful. So we wanted to eliminate this effect, so we control for that. It was not exactly interest of the study then. So this was actually our factors. As you see, they're not the same, right? Instead of having nine, nine criteria, we only had six. And the most important one was uh, local characteristics, which is a kind of general term for more um, scale items, right? When we talk about scale before, it's closer to scale. Then the second factor was rather experiential of those actors that had the reposition on the subjective and abstract scale. Remember I told you it was very complex. Factor three was about upkeep, was about the cleanliness of the destination. Factor four was uh, balance. We, we call it a sense of integrity, but it's the same thing. Perceived age and shape also was there. Uh, not the best composition when you look at it. Uh, we don't usually want to have two items per scale, but this, I, I didn't position the study as a, as a exactly scale development study because I think there are some limitations on that, okay? But it was enough for us to measure the effect. So this was a regression, uh, uh, PAQD, it's, uh, we, we named our scale perceived aesthetic qualities of destination, okay? Just what it is. So we basically, you can see here by regression uh, that when it comes to aesthetic judgment, what was important is the experiential domain, upkeep, and integrity or sense of balance, right? Those that were actually affecting the likelihood of people judging destination as more beautiful. Uh, when it comes to vacation satisfaction, it was the same, okay? So those three items were significant. But it also means that, like, local characteristic didn't matter, perceived age and shape didn't matter particularly either, okay? Which is very interesting as well, because it's that's something I expected. 
I expected this for shape, but I didn't expect that for characteristics and perceived age. So now we tested aesthetic distance, finally. So I mentioned we subtracted, right? We subtracted this force. It was, so the independent variables here was a difference according to each specific dimension. And that was actually very interesting. So when it comes to beauty, aesthetic judgment, right? We see that only two aspects mattered. It's experiential domain and upkeep. So what this means, the negative sign means here that if tourists think or judge their own home environment better or more superior in terms of experiential domain or in terms of upkeep, they're less likely to find destination beautiful. Basically, they have higher standards than others. <laughs> if they come from a destination that has been really good about maintaining uh, uh, aesthetic qualities, about cleaning destination, non-polluted areas, and also has a, quite a lot of diversity and variety, right? Uniqueness in experiential domain. So they're more difficult to impress when they travel. They're less likely, you basically have to work harder as a destination manager to do that. And again, no difference for local characteristics, uh, no difference for integrity, no significant perceived shape, uh, age or shape. And when it comes to satisfaction, right? Even only one, the aesthetic distance matters only in one criteria when it comes to experiential domain. And again, I remind you of those that are located in the second quadrant. So the most abstract and the most subjective, which actually not exactly a good news for destination managers because those are most difficult to manage. So they seem to be most difficult to manage, but also the ones that matter the most to your tourists, okay? Uh, so, as you can see from here, aesthetic distance did matter, but not in every domain. Uh, so, it's a, we need to have more a nuanced and more detailed understanding, actually, of how that works. And that brings me back to your question. So, for us, it's really important, like if you uh, if you manage an organization, right, or if you research in tourists, it's important to know where tourists come from. Because the tourists come from areas that are really good about cleanliness, ecological situation, there are no air pollution, there, there are no homeless on the street. And if you have this in your destination, so they're gonna be not impressed. They're gonna be, the judgment going to be negative, right? If you come from an area that is not that great, uh, maybe you're used to, so you, you, you won't, uh, there will be less of an effect, right? But another point here is that it's really important where you really come from, not in terms of simply a country, because very often we think about tourists depends on their source. Let's say tourists come from France or tourists come from Russia. Uh, but France is really different. If you come from Paris, it's not the same. You're used to a completely different environment, completely different architecture than if you come from Strasbourg or if you come from Marseille. Those are not only different in terms of uh, weather, but also architecture, shape, characteristics, pollution even different. Marseille is very polluted. Lyon so so and, and uh, Strasbourg is a very clean city. So we need to really understand where people are coming from, not simply country, but to understand which kind of aesthetic characteristics they used to. Okay. Any questions for this? Very interesting. <clears throat> um I have a question. Yeah. You know, like a uh, distance, psychological distance, aesthetic distance, anyway, people. You know, human beings are they are long for fantasy, something you know different from mine. Mm -hmm. So it's very natural you got the experience and domain minus effect toward this uh, vocation satisfaction. It's naturally. How about the <clears throat> similarity? Um, someone like a, and, and especially South Korean Korean guys, they uh, look around all over the world and bring their their own traditional food, like a gochujang, like a, the kimchi or, or sort of things and ramen and noodles, Korean noodles. It's, so it's a scenery, sensory effect by your eye that is, uh, is caught by uh, the aesthetic you know, distance. But the tongue, like uh, the food is, is if the too much distance it's, it's not good. It's difficult. To, <laughs> difficult. 
like like if in India. <laughs> so in that case, you know, aesthetic food is not an aesthetic, but anyway, probably there's a kind of a another distance. So no, actually, in that case, yeah. I I think I don't know uh, if I go Myanmar. Uh, probably I bring my gochujang and uh, uh, Korean ramen and uh, rice because I wonder and uh, the concerned sort of, sort of things. Uh, that's another kind of distance. What what do you think about that? <laughs> yes, I bring my tea with me. <laughs> so it's uh, no matter where I go. Uh, so it's, it's very, actually you said I food may be not part of aesthetics, but if you then we understand aesthetic multisensory, definitely not what I just showed you, right? We didn't look into it. But when we understand aesthetically multisensory, food is, is uh -huh. part of aesthetic, right? uh -huh. experience. But it's very interesting to see what we know is this aesthetic distance is really visual, as you can see, right? But when people travel, uh, we want some sort of, it's like hotels all often use, come here and you're gonna feel like home. But if I'm traveling and I wanna feel like home, I wanna feel like everywhere else, right? But then we always want to have a sense of like home where we come from, like, I know, food, and food is the first one. Food and drink is something we're used to, right? We don't want to compromise. So I think uh -huh. it would be, I, I don't have an answer for you here. There is no research on combining these two, but I think it would be very interesting actually to look into it, right? Uh -huh. To which extent people are finding this attractive or not attractive. Mm -hmm. Aesthetic distance is easy to see, but then when it comes to changing my routine, not having my coffee that I like every day, not for mm -hmm. my tea, mm -hmm. <laughs> or the kimchi, Mm -hmm. Some people may not have a Korean here who, who travels with kimchi, for example. Uh, so those kind of things, to which extent we're willing to compromise. But then also we know from cultural distance research that there is like a, like a uh, parabola relationship. It's actually only good up to a certain point and then it starts being good. It starts mm -hmm. being threatening and it's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. So when we travel for leisure, we want to go in the sweet spot, which is uh, good, just good enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't want to have too much of that distance. And I, I suspect that in aesthetic distance, it would be a similar relationship. And it would be interesting to test that. Uh, I haven't done this kind of research. And also your idea as well, how to test this aesthetic distance more multisensory. Actually, there are so many interesting research ideas you have just proposed. <laughs> so many aesthetic distance together with aesthetic visual, aesthetic taste relation, aesthetic in terms of sounds, aesthetic in terms of smell and what we find pleasant, right? Mm. And how it plays out in your experience or even that's an effect. So yeah, like a, you think, no. <laughs> a taste distance and um, smell distance. Uh, don't like it probably, but you know, Maybe. eye sight distance would be wonderful because. So yeah. if I optimize my you know preference, probably tongue, close distance, not far this ones, but mm -hmm. the eye sight like aesthetic distance. It's it's a wonderful things to see. It's a far distance, it would be fine. So it's a this uh, something configuration distance when yeah. we get the destination. Configuration. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think the, yeah, I don't think this hip is the same relationship or the same shape. I think it would be yeah, it would be different. Mm. Depends. And mm. I think taste is one of the first one. Like mm. this example, this great example. We don't really we always miss our foods. I like eating something exotic, but then after three days, I don't want it anymore, <laughs> even though it's really great, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm afraid that it's like, you know, there's also a joke, like tourist is a person who wants to travel, pays a lot of money to see mm -hmm. something new and mm -hmm. then complains that things are not like at home, mm -hmm. right? So it's this, this exactly. Like, exactly. So it's kind <laughs> of like, but there is, there is a must be like an optimal configuration of all of these distances, perhaps uh -huh. that is fine. Uh -huh. particular tourist or just provide a positive aesthetic experience uh -huh. Uh -huh. well see so uh -huh. many so many topics to explore <laughs> well in relation to that so my next and the last part of the presentation is to talk about what's next and i hope this is a more uh, for phd students particularly those who are developing your research topics for dissertations so, and this based on my curated collection, as I mentioned before, I do invite you to work in aesthetics and to submit topics, to submit your papers to my collection on Annals of Tourism Research. Again, collection means that I will be handling your manuscripts and I will be making the final decisions. Uh, and uh, it will be placed in a very special, of course, it will be assigned to regular issue, but it's also placed in a very special uh, space in, uh, on the website. 
where there will be all articles designated to the topic in annals ever. Annals is in all journals. We have we have a papers on aesthetics from like 80s. <laughs> so the, it's basically from there. So once one job, my job as a curator is to was actually to write a review article to provide pointers for younger researchers to take uh, ideas of beauty and aesthetics to the next level. And this is what I would like to, to talk about now. So I have I have just published it, it came out last month. Uh, it's a systematic literature review. And I did a very pretty much typical systematic literature search through Science Direct, Google Scholar using different um, key, uh, keywords. What's important is that I didn't try to talk just about tourism. I took it more broader perspective. It's a tourism and hospitality. Because let's face it, in many cases, I mean, it's impossible to separate, okay? Hotels, it's also part of tourist experience. So restaurant even too. So uh, surprisingly, I really thought that would be, well, I thought that I, I, my paper was one of the first to be published on the topic in 2014, but I really thought it, it was much more developed than it actually was. There were only 39 journal articles and book chapters ever, ever published in the entire time on aesthetic and tourism and hospitality. I was very surprised. That was very little. So what I did, I did basically a content analysis so that I tried to analyze trends of this uh, in terms of uh, publication by year, in terms of also um, method, but I also did the thematic analysis in terms of what are the common themes are covered and which also gives me an idea of what gaps exist. So that's what I would like to present to you. So by year of publication, I, I stopped my data collection on, in uh, June 2022, okay? So 2022 is not a full year here. However, when you look at the time of publication, there was one paper in 2003, and it was not in tourism journals. So my search was not limited to tourism journals, right? As long as the topic covered hospitality, tourism, and aesthetics, I consider that. Um, and this was this, this came from a literary uh, from a, a literature journal, and it was about analysis of guidebooks of Russia. Interestingly, of Russia, I was not have expected that. Uh, and that was two thousand three, and it seems like it was very random because nothing came out for like another four years, and then two thousand seven, two thousand eight, there were like uh, two studies. This study was also done in the literature. It was analysis of writing, I think, in England. 2008 was actually a study coming from China. That was a case study I mentioned to you about uh, national park and how infrastructure affects, uh, devalues aesthetically. So, and then 2009, nothing comes out. Really, when the topic has become uh, an area of research was in 2014. And 2014 was, uh, it was the year when I published my first study. But coincidentally, there was another researcher in Sweden who published us also study on aesthetic. And it was very interesting. I don't know her, still don't know her, but we had the same question, but we had a very different approaches and we had different contexts. So our results were quite similar in fact, which is great. But, and this is the year when she and I started working on this topic. And also it became more popular uh, in academia in general. But again, popular is really like a strong word to say <laughs> because at the best in 2010, 2020, 21, there's only six articles. So oh. popular is like relatively popular, okay? Yeah. It's not like a cell smartphone or smart tourism, which is really popular. But it's interesting that in 2022, uh, I uh, so by June, there were already four papers. So mm. if, we, if we extrapolate this, it would be at least eight. I have just looked what was published, I already found three papers and it's not even June, okay? So I think right now it's really gaining traction. So uh, this is by method. Uh, as that's very natural, actually, we see the most papers were qualitative, uh, quantitative. So they were more, con they were um, or mixed methods. They were empirical. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, very first studies they were actually conceptual, which makes sense because it's the beginning of the of the field. We need to think a lot before we can test something, before we collect data, right? So and then qualitative, quantitative, rather the same not particular preference, mixed method. 
And what we see when I, I put this trend on the time trend, we see that right now we have more and more quantitative papers and fewer and fewer qualitative and conceptual papers. In others, I put, uh, there were some papers that looked actually at machine learning. There are papers that analyzed, for instance, colors, you know, took a script of data from TripAdvisor and, uh, Trip and photographs and they analyze the colors that are more associated with aesthetic judgment of tourists. And I think there was the example of a Great Barrier Reef, for example. So they use the more innovative and more modern approaches, less classic, less traditional approaches. And I have seen that in the last two years. This is very recent. So it's another alternative for that, which is great. It means the field is developing. So then I have done a thematic analysis. So I read every paper, obviously. And I had to classify them in different categories based on the topic and I, based on the theme that was treated. And that was basically, I, 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 I separated them in two major categories. One was consuming aesthetic value, which is a paper that looked uh, really from a marketing or consumer behavior standpoint. My research is a perfect example. Okay, so my research was full scale. And producing aesthetic values, I look at the supply side. So here's more like demand side, here's supply side. And just looking here, you can see that demand side attracts more than twice of attention than the supply side, okay? <laughs> so it's more interested in tourists than actually destinations here. So when it comes to the supply side, uh, 11 papers were done about aesthetic judgment and experiences, similar to the one I presented to you in the beginning. There were a lot of there were 13 studies done about effects of tourism aesthetics, similar as I showed you to you in the beginning. And it was one very interesting area of research. It's very small, but it's about aesthetics and tourism sustainability. So I'd like to show you one example for that. This was actually research comes out in Switzerland, and I have a, re a reference for you here if you're interested. They looked at aesthetic perception of landscape of a shrinking glacier. So we have a in light of glo global warming, Right. In France, particularly in Alps and Switzerland and Italy, uh, there is a huge type of uh, there is a type of tourism called glacier tourism. When people go to see glacier, which basically is that uh, um, ice cap that never melts, and people do it in the summer, and it's really popular, brings a lot of money. For example, in Mont Blanc in France, but the problem with that is with global warming, the cap is declining. So this is an example of 1900. Look, this is a real glacier how it used to be, 1960s. And this is like 2015. Now, now it's probably worse. So pretty much almost no glacier left. So they look into the degree of effect of a glacier retreat on aesthetic perceptions of tourists. And they find that's pretty negative. Basically, the conclusion, if you glacier is gone, there will be people have no interest in going to see it. But on the other hand, it produces a phenomenon called last chance tourism. When people, right now, there's a lot of people who go there because they know it's gonna go and they want to be the last, they want to be one of the people who sees before it goes. So right now it's booming because people know it's going to disappear very soon. So there was a similar study done on a Great Barrier Reef, reef or in China, for example, about aesthetic value of the, of the, of the national park. So uh, another area of research for, su uh, for supply for supply side, we have two. It's very small anyway. The first one is the foundational issues in aesthetic management. And this is, uh, we see some researchers who, it's mostly conceptual papers. They discuss uh, importance of beauty and aesthetic for healthy destinations and propose frameworks on how to stage aesthetics and so on. I have a chapter on that as well, for example. Uh, and another very interesting, but unfortunately very small, is a uh, um, management of destination aesthetics. Those are actually empirical studies that focus on the supply side, on how to stage aesthetic for tourists in a, in a way that we do not compromise the destination viability. And I want to share you uh, to share one example with you. Uh, it's done with uh, in Korea. Amazing Wancha. paper. I highly <laughs> recommend. Yes. And I know you know this place, right? Located in Jeju Island. Jeju Island. It's a village, right? That's based on uh, this this author. So she actually analyzes how an ordinary village, nothing actually special, according to us, in this village, 
became such a tourist tourist attraction because of the Instagrammability, right? And this is, I just hear, I just cut and paste from her conclusion, really, how Instagram enabled ordinary places to emerge as trendy tourist destinations. And the author has found a lot of issues with that, right? That this kind of touristification uh, obscures the destination of justification. It, be, it makes destination commodified, touristified, and there has been a lot of issues with residents in terms of how places are, me and are measured and so on. So destination basically changes to account for that touristification to allow tourists because tourists bring money, they have more economic power, and they change the nature of the destination. <coughs> this is just an example I just cut and paste from the author. Really amazing paper, I highly recommend you to read. Uh, she's a, this author is a geographer. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and this is an example how things have changed of satellite images okay. just in 12 years, right? With a preference given to residents. Mm -hmm. In general, this line of research uh, investigates political, how aesthetic can become political on destinations. Mm -hmm. Whose taste are we prioritizing here? Are we prioritizing tourist taste, resident taste, or are we prioritizing something much more complex? I'm going to show you later. Well, interesting. Anyway, yes. I have one question. You know, you have been research many on topic the aesthetic. Is it so? very uh, surprising to me actually uh, uh, so far I, <laughs> I I couldn't say I am I'm an expert of a certain subject <laughs> yeah it's smart tourism but anyway I'm I here and there here and there I <laughs> research it. but you you have been researching on certain subject how can you do that that's the first question second question you know, as you shown us, there's Instagram. That is the digital, you know, aesthetic. Actually, bring people attention to visit there, and a lot of the young teenagers and and they are pushing on the Instagram image because of that aesthetic, digital aesthetic. Can 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 you uh, make differentiation the authentic? aesthetic by nature or digital aesthetic? I think I dropped a little bit. My connection was not great. I didn't okay. understand your second question. Yeah. Second question, yeah, digital know. aesthetic and the, and the authentic aesthetic. Uh, like a aesthetic I like in a digital environment and authentic. Yeah, I see. Uh -huh. Yes, actually, they, I didn't mention that, but there are quite a lot of recent studies about digital aesthetics. Mm. So I think if you've never even been, been to a destination, how we get our images of our aesthetic from Instagram posts, right? And they talk about beautification. So ordinary places became places of dreams simply because of Instagram, particularly Instagram. They discuss Instagram a lot. Uh, they also discuss different um, photos that shared on, on different social media in general. Yes, it's one of the aspects that destination wanted because it makes them it's a kind of like a free advertising and make people inspired and dream about their locations, mm. right? So for destinations, it's not bad actually to attract. And there have, has been studies about that looked specifically into what images are more effective mm. in terms of colors, which colors you should be using, which colors you should not be using. And the one study I mentioned that used machine learning actually, that's what exactly they studied, different mm. colors. And they even studied which object you should be placing on beauty, on, a, on a images. To, to elicit the response of positive aesthetic judgment of prospective tourists. Mm. So there has been area of research, and I think there's quite a lot of convergence between also smart tourism, how that can be done with technology, ICT technology and aesthetics as well. So in this situation, it's, it's mediated aesthetics. It's not actually, you're not actually there, <laughs> just the representations, right? And your first question about my area of research, I don't just research that, you know, I have a lot of other areas of research as well. It's, uh, I, I'm interested more in a tu a tourism experiences, right? But to me, you cannot really talk about tourism experiences without aesthetics. It's the reason we travel, right? We don't travel to see trash. <laughs> we travel to see beauty and we travel mm. to see difference. So to mm. me, it's just, that's just a core of that. Mm. And it's, yeah, it just maintains my interest because I'm really interested in how humans, us, I find humans super fascinating and very complex and you never know us 100%. <laughs> So, and uh, yeah, that, that's why. Mm. Good. Great. Did I answer your question? 
Yeah, I'm 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 MBU. You have to be. No, that's nothing for me here. Okay. Uh, so it's here not easy. Do it. <laughs> that's not easy, but it's uh, I I find it. I my research is very personal. If I try to find it personally interested, I can do it. If I don't find it personal, myself, <laughs> there is no way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So this is where to go from here. And we covered actually, thanks to you, we covered already a lot, but just wanted to put it all together. So based on my literature review, uh, there's a lot of gaps in the literature, a lot. So there's so many opportunities to develop this line of research. There's only very few people. There are few people who publish on this topic, like me and some other group. That's it. Like we really need diversity. We don't want everybody to think like me and have the same perspective, right? So uh, aesthetic experience is a first aspect. We discussed that, uh, like the first studies I shared with you, we really focused on destination aesthetic quality, what destinations have. So those are inputs. From psychology, we call them inputs. Then aesthetic judgment is an output. But we don't know what is happening between them. Well, there is a human, right? <laughs> but what's happening in a human, we don't know. Psychology provides a little bit of perspective when it comes to objects and art objects and also a little bit of consumer aesthetics, for example, a uh, new gadget, new cattle, but nothing about environments. So there's absolutely nothing, zero. So we don't know. Uh, another one is so far, if you notice, I have been talking about beauty, right? I said aesthetic means beautiful, but it's actually not correct. I just made it, I just simplified it. And I do that in the research as well because this is what we mostly talk about and this is more relevant than tourism. But if we actually would think further, it's not exactly correct assumption. Beautiful, of course, is important, but aesthetic is not limited by beauty, to beauty. There is also experience of the sublime. Sublime, and I have a picture here for you. Sublime is experience is a feeling when you stand on top of skyscraper, right? And it's kind of scary and it's uneasy, but at the same time, you could be amazed by what you see and what you feel. That's also positive aesthetic experience. There is also experience called the picturesque, and it all comes from uh, actually philosophy, again, the Euro European tradition, so there could be way more than that. Uh, picturesque is a, is a kind of scenery that is, you can take a photo. Those are pictures we usually are taking with our phones. It's a scenery, it's not really environment that we think is worthy to put in a photo. So these experiences arguably less emotion. Then we have experience of ugly. It's un, uh, in Kant, for example, talks about ugly is a necessary experience. If we don't have ugly, how can we know what's beautiful? So you need to have both. Uh, from a destination perspective, we cannot control being homeless on the street or like a lot of things we cannot control. So having tourists necessarily will have ugly experiences from some point. We know nothing about it. There has been zero research on this in tourism and even outside tourism, very little. But also there is an in-between. Let's not pretend this is all. What is this in-between? It's probably a continuum. Uh, again, uh, there is nothing published. My PhD student has just finished her thesis on that in-between experiences, right? But uh, this is, that's it. There is, we don't really talk about. There is, in, in our philosophy, we have a, uh, hints that they may exist, but there has been no empirical evidence for their existence or against their existence, okay? So we need to look at the diversity of experiences. Tourism experience is not limited to the beautiful only. Another one, this is about taste. <laughs> so far we have been talking about experiences about visuals. And it makes sense because as humans, we receive sense from our visual sense. But it's not only, right? We have smell, we have temperature, we have touch, we have taste, of course, we need to eat. Uh, how that experience, we know nothing about, zero. Uh, another thing, how about tourists who don't see very well? People who cannot smell well. After COVID, it's very relevant. Some people lost the sense of smell. Yeah. Uh, how is, how does this, what does this mean for tourist experiences? Uh, limited agency basically related to people with impaired senses. They may not sense your destination in the ways you intend them. Maybe you should enhance something. Again, we know nothing about it. Finally, uh, and this is exactly, we talk about Kant a lot. And Kant and all the research we talk about is SOR. And I'm sure you know about SOR. We have uh, 
stimulus organism and response, right? So basically S is your destination features, response, aesthetic judgment, or is experience. But that's actually only one perspective. There are other perspectives. We don't look into it at all. But is aesthetic judgment really subjective but universal? Maybe it's not universal at all, but that's what Kant suggests, and we in research take it for granted. Is there really an object, a subject distinction? Can we say that person who judges environment removed himself or herself from environment? When it comes to art objects, it kind of maybe makes sense. But when it comes to tourist environments, it's a very questionable assumption. So uh, one example, one suggestion I have is to take a look into Bonhelm Bochme, which is a modern German philosopher who actually challenges this perspective. And he specifically talks about environments, not objects. Not about tourism per se, but it's as close to tourism as you can get. In my collection, there has been recent study, and I have here the reference for you. It's a tourism study that first time challenges this. They don't look into Bachmi perspective per se, but they look into sublime experiences and how sublime is actually is not, it doesn't make you an object or subject, how it's actually only connected to one person. One study so far, only one, imagine that, for the whole tourism literature and very recent one. Finally, uh, not finally, so the fifth point is aesthetic and well-being. Uh, I have a photo here. Does anybody know this destination? Maybe hard. Um, Remind me something. Uh, Bombay. <laughs> no, it's New York. New York? New York? Wow. Mm -mm. Mm. Last try. It's, um, I don't know. Bergen? Malta. Huh? Malta. 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 Yes. Malta. I've never huh? been there, so huh? I, I, I don't know. That's, uh, but is the reason I'm showing you this is uh, there was one, two studies actually in my sample of literature review that was done using example of Malta. And this research has looked at the development of urban development of Malta, of uh, the capital Valletta, uh, how it become more and more and more tourist destination. And what we observed is that the more tourism gained power, uh, the more uh, people, they started prioritize aesthetic taste of people who had money over upper class and rich people and also mm -hmm. tourists. Mm -hmm. So which is minority. So majority of residents is excluded. So people have a different aesthetic taste. People have a different perspectives. Mm. So whose taste we are here to prioritize when it comes to destination? We all live in one city. We, let's say we all live in Valletta. People have a different ideas, different incomes. Are we doing what's good for tourists? Should we prioritize their taste? But then they only come here for a week. How about residents who live here, who may have different taste? And they discuss this case study of Valletta, how uh, aesthetics become uh, the tool of politics. Okay, whose interest we prioritizing. Mm -hmm. So aesthetic and well-being, aesthetic has been linked in psychology and many other research has been linked to well-being. But so far, uh, all research we have that tested effects of aesthetic, we always test effects on destination relevant outcomes, such as satisfaction, loyalty, like my example, like that's what I did, right? But we should move on from that. We should move on to study more about well-being. Uh, well-being of tourists, does it affect well-being of tourists in which way? Well-being for residents, perhaps more important. Mm. And the destination as a whole, what is a good for a destination for economic, social, and environmental development of the destination? And finally, and this is the point I feel always also very strongly about, aesthetics across cultures and national contexts. How are Kant's ideas and all of these philosophical ideas I shared with you applicable to non-European destination and tourists? What in my literature review, what I see, there was quite a lot of studies from, from China, for example. There were studies from China. There were two studies from Korea. And except for one, all of them using Western European philosophy as, as foundation. Why? <laughs> and there is also, we need to valorize, we need to understand that many cultures have different ideas of aesthetics. Interestingly, there is even evidence in psychology that uh, there was a comparison between uh, British and Chinese, mm. the way how they judge a uh, piece of art, museums mm. actually, not even mm. tourism per se. And they found that whatever, Ameri or whatever British perceived as beautiful, 
was not the same what that what Chinese perceive as beautiful. Not the That's same right. objects. They think it differently. Mm -hmm. And then we in our research we all use this accounting idea to test perception of tourists from those markets. Mm -hmm. Markets are becoming increasingly diverse. So we need to diversify our perspective as well. That's right. And uh, it may be difficult for like me coming to Korea and trying to understand that, but you being in this context, you're well positioned to contribute in this, in this way. In conclusion, I want to say that aesthetic is a fascinating topic, but let's start thinking and researching aesthetics differently. Let's not repeat what has been done. Let's break the boundaries, right? And get out of the box. Right. That's all I have to say for you. Oh, we don't have that much time for questions, unfortunately. Sorry about uh, that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Krasha. It's, it's time to for our students who have highly interest in new topics. Students, you, your time. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'm too shy to say. Give them time to process a bit. Let's take a minute. Uh, uh, yes, I have, a, uh, yes. <laughs> I have a simple question. Uh, actually, uh, my sub major is uh, I'm, uh, I, I mean, I'm interested in uh, smart tourism, so I uh, I'm very interested in uh, the role of the smartphone in perspective of tourism. But uh, uh, I guess many researchers think that smartphone is uh, only useful to search information about the tourism, not uh, aesthetic tourism. I mean, in perspective of it, aesthetic tourism. So, uh, so I think in perspective of aesthetic tourism, the smartphone has a has more negative effect for aesthetic tourism, I guess. So, but I think sometimes smartphone has very positive effects to the aesthetic tourism, for example, as you said, the or the photos or or something like that. So I just wonder your opinion uh, about the positive effect of the smartphone for the aesthetic tourism. Thank you for the question. No, I don't, I don't think particularly has a negative effect. It's the way people, we use cell phone right now, it's basically extension of us. And that's how we experience our destinations through taking photos very often. It's actually interesting. Uh, it's not something I have not seen this research to see, to maybe analyze uh, as photos taken by tourists. You can see a pattern probably, right? Different tourists, different patterns. It's, uh, we try to immortalize, we try to keep the aesthetic with us, right? Because we cannot come and return to destination, so we try to keep it with us. So from this one perspective, but it's also another perspective when we take in a photo, it comes, becomes a mediated aesthetics. So yes, if I'm just standing and staring at Niagara Falls, that's just me experiencing this. But if I'm standing and then, or maybe later, I'm taking a photo as well. So I'm kind of interacting with the destinations through mediation of the smartphone, right? It's, again, nothing has been done about this. To me, as uh, again, that's, uh, that's the reality of how people right now experience destinations, and we don't know anything about it, so. Russia, I have a question. You know, photo and the mobile, uh, uh, mobile, uh, the, the contents. These days, a lot of uh, the young generation uh, uh, pay attention to see the like TikTok mobile stuff. But I think uh, the still portal may influence uh, significantly than the mobile stuff. What do you think about that? I don't think I missed the question. I'm sorry. Okay. Question is, uh, we have a portal. We have a mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, Recently, the young generation has more interest in keen, keen on the mobile you know, contents, yeah. especially mm -hmm. TikTok yeah. contents. Mm -hmm. But I think for for destination, is a photo is much more important than the mobile. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Oh, 
but that depends on the type of experience, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about picturesque, the definition of picturesque, if something goes in the floor, it's not supposed to move. Mm -hmm. But for that type of experience, actually, yes, the photos, that's basically the quintessential expression of picturesque. Mm -hmm. But for sublime, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. very often we actually take videos because sublime is something, it's a feeling. And you mm -hmm. don't get captures of sublime in a photo. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very often you usually have videos for that to capture that aspect. So I feel like, yeah, for that, uh, that would be more short videos. Even mm -hmm. to my PhD student when she got different topics. But she, when she did her research in Hong Kong, she actually asked people mm -hmm. to, to either record or to take photos mm -hmm. of what they think is worth, what they, found, what they like in the, in the destination. So there were some videos actually as well. So they, they did it as well. So it's not exclusive, particularly, not at all. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. I have, have a question. This, uh, like a, uh, smart things, right? And that was completely underexplored. Yes, please, John. Go ahead. Um, so I remember going to Hallstatt in Austria. And before actually getting to that destination, I remember being super excited after seeing the photo of the city. And once I got there, I can't say, I still don't think that the photo was different from what I actually saw. Like it, it captured everything, but then I couldn't help but disappoint at my experience there. So in this may, so I'm a, still a bit, confused about what I'm thinking but do you think my experience or my disappointing experience is largely due to the aesthetics or the visual representation per se yeah I think it's a due to <laughs> to uh to high expectations that was actually yes mm. that was fueled by, by by this so in this article that all by all uh about um Jeju village right she talks about it how how ordinary, completely ordinary, I've never been to this village, so I don't know how ordinary it is, how completely ordinary place can be presented so aesthetically on Instagram that right. it started the whole trend of people visiting, right, of, of coming there. Right. Now, she did not talk about these expectations, but she does mention that how this imagery creates uh, this allure or dream of the right. destination that right. actually may not, that may not even deliver, right? right? It's just that mm -hmm. kind of a trend. We see in Paris a lot of this. Um, <clears throat> you're probably familiar with this. Uh, there is a term, <laughs> Paris syndrome. <laughs> it's when people come and they're so much disappointed in Paris and they like cannot recover, they get depressed. I think mm. it's the same. Like people, honestly, I was disappointed in Paris. There's <laughs> a the so manipulation think, aesthetic. Yes, and particularly some places, I think like Paris really, and Paris doesn't do anything about it. They don't really do any marketing anymore. It's really people just, taking photos, mm. try to portray Paris in a way that it's not actually what it really is. Mm. There are only two, three places. Or the, they really, you really need to find places like you saw on Instagram, really. It's not like you go and see it everywhere. Mm. But it creates this expectation, this imagery, this dream. Mm. And yeah, that's also a concept of a tourist gaze a little bit, how we manipulate and kind of marketing, we create this. There's also point of digital gaze, right? Mm. Right now it's a digital channel. Digital channel. Yeah. But honestly, for tourism, like when I did my research on uh, this aesthetic distance, it's really not good. Like for practically, you don't want that. You want to have very realistic expectations. Mm. And if before we had an issue of opposite, people didn't have expectations. They didn't want to go because they had low expectations. Now we have opposite problem, like you described, mm. but hyped up, <laughs> mm. but then there is nothing. Mm. So, yeah. That's right. Mm. Who's next? Hello, Professor. I have, um, actually, I have two questions. So first of all, like, I really appreciate for your in, uh, beautiful lecture. And the first one is you mentioned about the nine factors of destination beauty in your first paper. So uh, I think like we still have uh, visual uh, visual pollutions in urban city, especially in urban city, like uh, floating with the slogans or like, um, slogans or logos or billboards in our streets or like especially you can see in Hong Kong as well in Seoul in London as well so uh so some people from like gantry side they might think like this is the beauty uh, this can be like beautiful but most of the people don't think like that so uh, how do you think of these uh billboards or slogans uh slogans so should we put 
uh, into the beauty or like ugliness of the destinations. So an another question is like, mm, we can see a lot of images in the internet. Um, internet, so, uh, the, so the images are like from the uh, from the DMO and, and UGC. So there, uh, so here my question is like there can be like different presentations of the destination beauty, uh, from the U uh, from the UGC and the DMO. So how do you think of the difference between them? Yeah, thank you. Interesting question. Well, I'll start with the second question. Uh, uh I don't know if there is any difference. No studies on that. So we know like from other studies, right, when it comes to messages, people tend to trust <laughs> UGC more than the trust demo, obviously. But I think going back to John's comment uh, previously, that's what creates actually this overhype. DMOs don't really do that. They more try to be more realistic with representation about this kind of viral videos and viral photos, starting with Instagram that began this trend. That's kind of not exactly a negative. But in terms of effect, we don't know anything. So it would be interesting to test that actually. And your first question about uh, this uh, visual pollution, right? It actually was one, it was a part of this criteria I talked about out of place in, in part of balance, right? So we did have people who said that um, it appeared to kind of out of place, but on the other hand, it's not necessarily negative impact, right? For some, it's actually contributed to diversity. And for some, that was actually what made it interesting because it was not exactly uniform. So this criteria didn't, at least in our research, right, we didn't, uh, it was not part of that, but it would be, of course, interesting to test. I would say it depends on the person. It would depend on target market preferences. For somebody, it would be definitely a big no-no, and for somebody, it would just contribute to authenticity of experience. Like in Hong Kong, that's when we did uh, research with my students, that's what it was. A lot of Western tourists who came to Hong Kong like that aspect because they don't really see that, let's say, in, in, in small France village or like in, UK, in UK, not from London. I know it's mostly associated with the big cities, this phenomenon, but when they go to Hong Kong, they find it unique, interesting, especially this neon signs. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, if you leave there, it's kind of ugly, but then for somebody who came from somewhere else with a great aesthetic distance, for them, it's interesting and uh, it adds to experience. So there is no clear cut, uh, it depends on uh, on uh, in the, the, the personal the persona, I guess. Okay, we have uh, seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, question! Wow, that's my email. Mm -hmm. if you want to keep in touch? Um. How can I pronounce it, uh, uh, precisely your your name? Senia. Senia. It's, it's Senia Karlova. Yeah, yeah. The way it's written, the way you pronounce it, exactly. It's Russian is easy. <laughs> so. Senia Karlova. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the student no questions, so I I. You know, as you know, the I I managing the General of Smart Tourism, which is newly launching three years ago. Uh, I don't have the aesthetic the perspective paper. <laughs> it's not too late to start. <laughs> okay, so I, I mean, so please submitting the the at the point of the aesthetic, uh, the the perspective, uh, for the General of Smart Tourism. It would be yeah. great to have. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. I'm not an expert in smart stuff, honestly. Uh, no, no, no. I don't need that smart. <laughs> I, 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 I want to hear from you the, the authentic and the nature of the asset point. So, okay, yeah. So, yeah. I'm not into gadgets and devices. That's just definitely uh, my big point. In, in it my doesn't mind. necessarily to to uh, smart or technology. I just want to hear from you the, the concept of human nature. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my interest. I feel like uh, there is a lot of technologies and mm -hmm. trends, mm -hmm. in, and that's important to research them. 
Yes. But I don't I don't like researching them. I feel like there are a lot of people who do that, so you don't need me. I mm-hmm. like to research things that don't change. And what doesn't change is to me is human nature, right? Yes, and right. to me now, right. one area of research for me as well is the existentialism mm-hmm. I mentioned mm-hmm. before, like it's philosophy. Right. Mm-hmm. It is about what we as humans feel like when we live through life. And mm-hmm. those are fundamental, it doesn't yes. change, and it's universal. Yeah, sure, it, experiences mm-hmm. could be different, mm-hmm. but Mm-hmm. No, no matter if you are Korean or Russian, we're still going to die. <laughs> we still have the same composition mm-hmm. and we still have the same concerns. So that's yes. my interest to really mm-hmm. research those mm-hmm. natures. Mm-hmm. So my my point of uh, view about the aesthetics, like uh, human nature and uh, naturally, also, uh, the fundamentally, we don't change, but different window. The actually people like uh, you and me, uh, we are uh, physiologically, we are we are uh, the analog, the object. So we look at the things aesthetically by eye, but these days a lot of people uh, look at the certain subject uh, through the window. Means window means a uh, smartphone or apps. Or Instagram, social media, or ChatGPT, sort of things. So anyway, the majority of people enjoy that kind of you know devices and then artificial intelligence device and sort of things. Anyway, so like your paper, uh, we have to somehow develop for you know digital aesthetics, which is need in time. Yeah. I hope so. There is, you know, there is some a bit of research in like human computer interaction about interfaces, right? But it's not yes. about tourism. Yes. They don't talk about how like it's tourism supposed to transmit the same in a mm-hmm. digital format. None of that. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, students, uh, it's a Friday. Um, and we have a question in the chat. Okay. Chat. Which part of Seoul do you think excels compared to Lyon? Uh, Seoul, honestly, <laughs> I've been to Seoul, but it was a really short visit. <laughs> and I don't think, I, and I stayed somewhere like far. I've been, I've seen some some parts, but I don't think I have, an, I, I have an opinion of that simply because I need to make another trip to Seoul to give you answer to this question. <laughs> mm-hmm. But a great question, yeah, because it would be a different perspective. Mm. Okay, um, uh, one last address for our students, if you have, before we wrap up. Senior, uh, can, you, can, you, can you give your uh, the address for our students who are now currently studying? Yes, uh, I'm, going to, I'm gonna write it in a chat. However, our school has just changed the name, so it may change, but not for now. So if you send me an email, I will probably have your information. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, now Friday night, uh, it's time to go for a party. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> look forward to see you face to face, Senior. Hope one day. Thank One you day. so much for having me. All good luck with research and have a great weekend. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, Goodbye. Professor. It was nice seeing you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. 자, 다음 주에 뵙겠습니다. 다음 주에는 아마 아침이겠죠? 음.